oh, that's what made it great is because they did that thing. And it's like, no, 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 no. There was something else going on. There was something deeper for the for the writer of the story that they were trying to communicate. And that device was simply the thing that was going to help communicate that mm -hmm. at, a, at a bigger level. So that's a device that can still come into play, but it has to it has to be in service to something. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's really what the inner significance is. It's just yeah. like, what, what's, what is the outward appearance in service to? Because it can't just be about the outward uh, appearance of it. Yeah. It's got to be connected to something. Why are you doing that? Right? Not just because it's cool. This is Way of the Artist with Brandon Colby Cook and Evan Schulte. Identifying your blocks and demystifying your struggles so that you can claim your own path and make your life a work of art. Welcome to the show. Welcome to another podcast episode. <laughs> with Brandon and Evan. And uh, this time we're doing something a little bit different. We're calling this the Artist Wisdom Series. At least that's the working title, but it probably will stay that way. And today we got a quote for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to do these, we're thinking we're going to do these uh, episodes every once in a while where we take a quote from, you know, a semi or really famous artist or somebody that made an impact in the world through art. And we're going to take one of their wisdoms and we're going to use that quote. We're going to share the quote and then talk about it and break it down and kind of maybe show how it relates to all the wisdoms and things that we've been trying to share in our art because, uh, well, with our artist podcast, because I mean, really what, what we're doing is we gathered a lot of wisdoms through artists, through all our interviews and all those things. And lo and behold, you go and you look back and you see these artists of old who have said essentially the same thing, which tells us that, you know, artists have been carrying these wisdoms for centuries. You know, we've been probably even longer. We've just been passing along these, this torch of wisdom and art over and over and over again. And every generation uses it in their own way, but they essentially use the same thing. This quote by Aristotle is the aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but their inward significance. So Evan, what do you got to say? <laughs> oh man. I mean, I'm sure I've got a few things to say about that. Uh, yeah. I, I love in some ways that, uh, that we're starting kicking off this, this quote series in, in some respects with, uh, with, you know, someone like Aristotle, like going way, way back uh, into civilization. I don't know. Artist Aristotle was, I don't know if he was really an artist so much as he was a philosopher, but I mean, there's a, there's, there's an argument to be made that, uh, that we often make that almost anything can be, can be made into an art form. Um, and in fact, as we were going through different, some different quotes, I, I think I saw something like that, like how anything can be turned into art but anyhow uh and and yeah how anything can be turned into art but uh yeah no i love this this uh this aristotle quote not the outward appearance but their inward significance um because i think that within art specifically I think that we get caught up sometimes a lot. We, we get almost bamboozled by how things look, right? And it's like, oh, well, you know, like we, when we only see the surface of, of something, like we can understand that in terms of like, you know, a, a really big budget movie that's got all of the effects and whatever, and you watch it by the end of it, you're just kind of like, you've already forgotten about it. You know, there's there was no meaningful inward significance to uh to what you just to what you just saw and i know i've i've seen the same thing you know with with many forms of education but i'll stick with acting cuz it's my main area of of expertise but you know like seeing a lot of how acting is broken down uh a lot of time of, of the time by intellectuals and academics and i'm not 
anti-academic or or intellectual by any stretch of the matter but they're this sort of reductionistic um mode of thinking that uh that sometimes just entirely misses the point you know like so you'll watch a you know, people who watch a terrific performance by some actor and they'll say it's like, oh, well, their performance was great because they uh, they performed the role with uh, with a secret. They had a secret and that was yeah. a technique that they did. And that's why it was so great. And it's like, well, that might have been an element of it. But is that the whole totality of it? No. Like and and I think that there's a, a, a that can lead to like a huge misunderstanding um for a lot of people who are are studying acting and and for anything that you're you're studying um with any degree of passion is that you know sometimes we we mistake the a lot of these techniques for the thing itself and and that's based on appearance it's just like oh well we saw that and we're trying to put it into some objective measure right but um you know interestingly enough this is maybe another quote to explore, but uh, from William Esper, who is an acting teacher in Meisner, he was saying that, you know, actors and artists uh, are concerned with the subjective, you know, like w more than than the objective. So it's interesting. We try and when we try and study art forms that, you know, they're try we try to reduce them down to objective forms. And sometimes there's there can be a value to that. But I find that very often it can that can be a very misleading thing for people as well. And and in many ways, like the study of it is is kind of its own art form. You know, like I find that a lot of academics and and intellectuals and scholars, it's like it's kind of its own performance. You know what I mean? Like it's 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 kind of doing its own thing. And I think that's great. You know, like to break it down, it's fascinating. You know, it can be very interesting to to do that and and to see how and, and understand uh, an art form from that perspective. But it is just a perspective. And very often that perspective doesn't have a whole lot to do with how you actually do the thing <laughs> as an artist, you know, approaching it. So uh, I don't know. I guess those are just some initial thoughts that I have to kick off that that comment. So. I'll uh, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, so little little history lesson on Aristotle. He was the student of Plato, and Plato was a student of Socrates, and you could consider them that they were mentors to these people. And Aristotle was like a philosopher and a scientist primarily. Um, and what I think is really interesting about those three men in history and and what they contributed to what is a very big part of our culture today is that they were very interested in trying to figure out what story was and what art was. And they were trying to understand these things. And they were, um, what, what I find interesting about having people know that Aristotle was a scientist was that he considered art a part of the science. Hmm. Like they all did. They, they, and the philosophy was a part of the science. And actually I, I would, I would even branch out to argue that science without art and without philosophy is lost. Mm. And I think that that's part of the problem that a lot of us face today is that we try and do things in scientific ways, like without philosophy and without art. And so that's where the actor goes, oh, I know the technique, the scientific technique, because that's really what it is of he has a secret or she has a secret. And that's what made their performance great you got to understand the philosophy of the secret. You got to understand the art of the secret. You got to understand the inner significance, which is what Aristotle was talking about. It's like, yes, it is a secret. The appearance of what you're seeing is a secret, but why the secret? Where does the secret come from? How does it relate to the story? How does it relate to whatever's happening? All of those things are relevant. And the response that the actor will have having the secret and having an internal world related to that secret makes something special happen. It isn't just having a secret. Like if it is just having a secret, then, then all you have to do is just every time you have a performance, just make up a secret and have a secret and then you're good, but it doesn't work that well. It doesn't work that way. And it doesn't work that well 
because the thing is, is that the secret needs context and it needs relationship and it needs an internal world, internal significance. And like how you feel about that or how your character would feel about that, um, you know, all of these things are relevant. And this very secret that you choose or the very secret that say the writer chooses or whatever is going on, um, you know, and also in the line that you have as an actor, it might not dawn on you that the line is said in a certain way, being that maybe you're actually lying when you're saying that line. And so the character's line is, I love you. And you, and you say it genuinely, you, you say it authentically. I love you. But the character is lying about it. They're not saying it like the character doesn't really mean it because what's the secret? I don't know. Like, and, and the audition coach would say, oh, well, you have a secret love affair with someone else. And, you know, and really you, you, you have love for someone else, but you, but what if it's like more complex than that? What if there's something else to that where it's like, I love you, but not in that way anymore. And I'm, or, you know, there's in this moment, I don't love you, you know, and, and, but I feel obligated to say it, or, you know, what if it's like, I'm trying to manipulate you. There's, there's a whole world that comes in with the secret in say an acting performance. Right. And so my, my point is, is like, yeah, it's a technique in acting to have a secret as an actor. It's, it's a technique in writing to give your, your character secrets but that's like the science of writing, the science of acting, right? What's the art and the philosophy of it? What's the inner significance of it? And I think that's kind of what Aristotle's getting at. He's talking about how there's so much more to the picture than the obvious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, thank you for doing a, a little bit of a history lesson as far as Aristotle and what he was chiefly concerned with. And and it is, it's, it's a fascinating part of, uh, you know, like sort of like those the Greek, you know, these great Greek philosophers who um, wrote and and said a lot of things and, and that are really in many ways still foundations in which uh, our, our society and our culture is, is based upon. But one of the things that always strikes me is that, you know, these were, you know, when you look at the sort of like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, these were you know, arguably the great minds, uh, of their time. And there was this tremendous value and appreciation that they had for the arts. Like it, for them, they, they knew while maybe not being necessarily artists themselves understood the significance of it, like understood just how important art was in, being able to communicate certain things that in many ways the the sciences just are not able to do like i've heard i can't remember where I've, i i heard this before but this is something i've heard from probably a number of, of different people but um you know this whole thing of like this idea that science can tell us what things are but cannot tell us what they mean mm. You know, and and in many ways, I think that that sort of comment is uh, th this quote in some ways reflects that, right? Like, yeah, we can understand what it is, but we don't know what it means. You know, it's like, uh, you know, like sometimes we have the capacity to do things like in today's day and age in, in our world, we have the capacity to do just extraordinary things. But, you know, that question of should we do certain things? You know, do we go there? Do we open up this Pandora's box of something where we don't know? Like these are these are things that that science cannot necessarily answer. They don't always. I mean, some people I think would disagree with 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 this. Um, I know there are many people who believe that science can answer certain moral questions, and perhaps some of them they can. Um, but I think that in many ways, like science does not always speak to our experience. You know, like I was saying before, like to our subjective experience as human beings, what it is to, 
to be alive and have relationships and to experience pain and and to navigate the world in a life there's this whole experience that that we have with that that it is not best suited to communicate mm-hmm. and that's where art comes in and we've all for most of us we've all been exposed to shit art and we've been exposed to really great art there's the art that is just you see it or you hear it or whatever it is and you're you're just like yeah okay you know like it's it's it it, it doesn't do anything but then there's the stuff that that lands with you it has a quality to it where it's just like you know it, it rips into your it rips into your heart it rips into your guts it rips into you know some some level of who you are and it moves you, you know, like it, it gives you some kind of catharsis or perspective. There's an emotion that, that you connect with. And I think that that is when art is doing that thing of, of showing the inner significance, right? The, and I don't know, I don't know. I'll, I'll stop there. I'll stop there. What do you got, Brandon? I think when you are new into interpreting art, you don't really have much of a taste for what good art is and what isn't good art. I mean, like everything, like, like art is something that to actually understand it, it takes time. You, you, like you acquire the ability to understand what is good art and what isn't. Um, you know, I think that's why, you know, if, if somebody who has like no experience with art goes into a modern art type of scenario, they can't tell the difference between what's bullshit and what's actually really creative and cool. Um, you know, like I remember when I first started looking at modern art, which I honestly, I'll be honest, I, I like, I could care less about modern art for the most part, but I do have a certain respect for certain modern art that I have seen because one thing I've learned about modern art, and this is probably super elementary because there's probably other people that know way more about this than I do, but modern art can basically take what's basic about art, what's common and what's usual, and it can kind of push outside the lines of it. And it can um, actually play on something that's common. And because it's doing that, it makes it unique. And it, it has an awareness of what it's doing. And so like, I try to parallel this with uh, say screenwriting because screenwriting, there's so many movies that have been made and like 10 times, if not a hundred times more screenplays that have been written. So there's a lot of story ideas and things that have already been used before. And if you use them again, they're, they're basic. They're, they're actually not artistic at all. They're like using a technique. So a very common technique that's used in screenplay writing is, and I still see movies get made who do this, but it's always, I always go, wow, this movie's super basic. Like it has already, it's already like shooting off of its back foot because it's like, you know, it's, it's already behind because what it does is it takes some part of the end of the movie or near the end of the movie, shows it at the beginning and then cuts it off and goes, this is what's going to happen eventually. And then it starts the movie mm-hmm. and that's called a hook. And it's like the first few times that was used, it was awesome. People were like, wow, that's so cool. What a creative thing. Now when it's used, it's just uses like this ploy, this trick. There's so many better ways to hook your audience into a movie. And there's so many more creative, unique ways. And there's ways that have not been done yet. But if you rely on technique, you rely on the science of storytelling, the science of screenwriting, you end up using these really basic ideas that actually rob your art of art. And so, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a certain element of it, which is like, um, you, you know, learn the rule, learn the, the kind of guideline, learn the idea, and then abandon it and try to find something else because something that worked once is not necessarily going to work again, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think the part of the problem is, is like the scientific mind with art goes, well, this worked before, so it'll work again. And yes, technically it will work, but it doesn't really work. And, Mm -hmm. and 
And the significance is what works. And what you're missing is that significance. You know, you're missing that quality. So, you know, you, you got to like, and I mean, we, we talked about this because we've had other conversations about this, but you got to like often dig deeper. You know, it's not a, um, you, you got to go beyond the appearance of what you're doing. You got to, you got to know what's common and then you got to go, okay, well, this is common. So what would be a unique way to take this further or do this differently or make it deeper, something else. Otherwise, everybody knows what you're doing and it's a yawn. It's just a big yawn, you know, and it's not a hook at all. Yeah, it, it becomes just sort of like a, you know, patchwork is almost is is almost too too kind of a term for it. You know, <laughs> like, um, you know, color by numbers is a, is a good way yeah, to, yeah, exactly. to paint that because it's like, you know, it's not that like using that particular technique is bad and that you can never do it you know like that specific thing you're bringing up of like where you sort of you reference the end or something that's going to come into play at the end at the beginning right like a very cool device the first time that we saw it um but again very often you know it gets this goes to something that i was saying earlier which is you see that it's like oh see what they did there like you know, the first time that you saw it, first couple of times, it's like it's like, oh, look what they did. They they put that thing at the beginning, and it comes into play. How cool, right? And you get stuck on the surface of it, right? You get stuck on the outward appearance of the thing, and so it's like, oh, that's what made it great is because they did that thing. And it's like, no, 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 no. There was something else going on. There was something deeper for the for the writer of the story that they were trying to communicate, and that device was simply the thing that was going to help communicate that at mm -hmm. a at a bigger level. So that's a device that can still come into play, but it has to it has to be in service to something. You know what I mean? Like that's that's really what the inner significance is. It's just yes. like what what's what is the outward appearance in service to? Because it can't just be about the outward uh, appearance of it. Yeah. It's got to be connected to something. Why are you doing that? Right. Not just because it's cool. There's, um, you know, like I know you've read Larry Moss's book. It's a, it's a, for everybody who's not an actor, it, most actors have probably read this book before the intent to live by Larry Moss. It's a great book, uh, about acting, uh, but he's got this one little chapter, which is more of like a rant <laughs> about yeah. being cool and how he just hates this thing of like being cool and looking cool. Like it is just the death of you as an actor. If you're trying to be cool in what you're doing. Uh, and it's, I, I think it's the same way with, with so much like trying to be cool. If that's your goal is just like, it, it's going to come, what you do ends up coming out hollow. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, again, it's getting stuck on the outward surface. You know, you're, you're looking at everything else that everyone else has done. And you're going, okay, let's take a little bit of that and a little bit of that and a little bit of that. It's like, hey, be influenced, be inspired by all means and, and, and borrow from, from people who have done great work. But just know that what they did was never about that thing. Mm -hmm. It was never about that thing. It was in service to something more that they were trying to yeah. do. I love this. I love that you brought this in because this is this is another good opportunity for a history lesson and huge for the artists. Um, being cool, the behavior, the response, the way you dress, the things you do are all a, are all actually a byproduct of an inner significance. And this is the thing that has been lost on a lot of people is they think, oh, the guy wore these glasses or that's cool. I'm going to wear those glasses too. And it's like, no, like, see, you, you're missing the point. Like those glasses were not because they thought they looked good. They, like necessarily, they weren't trying to be cool. Like they were, for example, someone wore sunglasses. Like, uh, here's, a, here's what, like, what's a better example? Um, what's that guy, Nelly? He, he put a Band-Aid on his cheek because he had oh, a yeah. zit and he went up to, he went to the awards, right? And he wasn't like, he had a zit and he could have tried to cover it with makeup or do whatever. And he's like, fuck it. I'm going to put a bandaid on it and I'm just going to own it. Right. And he did. Yeah. And putting a bandaid on your cheek became this kind of cool thing, this cool rapper thing. Now, 
no one talks about the fact that he had a zit. <laughs> I didn't even know that story. <laughs> it, was something like that. it was like a zit or something, right? It was like some, and he had to go to a word show, right? And he had this, uh, you know, he, he had a blemish on his face or something, right? So um, the, the Band-Aid thing apparently became like this thing and then people copied it and whatever, and then it, it went out and it's not cool yeah. anymore. It's just weird now. But it's like, <laughs> um, so let's go to the history lesson of cool. Where did the word cool come from? The word cool came from, uh, it's from what I understand at least, and you know what, someone write and correct me if I'm wrong, if you have some other interpretation, but from what I understand, it, it came out during the time of the Vietnam War, really, that was kind of when it was around, and basically, people who knew that the Vietnam War was not what it appeared to be on the media and the propaganda, and they knew that something was wrong, and like, they, they just knew that there was something fishy, and they were called cool. So when people would get invited to a party, they'd be like, this guy's cool. She's cool. Meaning that they know they're in the know they're aware mm -hmm. they're, they're not like a drone following the media, right? Being cool was kind of, a, it, and it became a quality. So basically the people who knew they had a quality about them. They had a bit of a hippie nature to them. They had a bit of a free thinking nature to them. They had a certain quality. That's what cool became. And then people started to model that appearance and go, this is cool. And then cool started to become this um, image thing. But mm. initially cool, from what I understand, was actually you're cool because you, you know, you're, you're cool. Like you're chill. Like you're not getting, you're not all uptight. You're not like, you know what I mean? Like you're relaxed, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what it meant. And if you think about the, the, the lineage of this word, it's being relaxed in your skin, relaxed in your beliefs, relaxed in who you are. And so you as an artist are cool when you're like owning it, when you're in it, but the things you do will be cool, but you won't do them because they're cool. You'll do them because you're cool. And you don't even know it. Like, cause that's what cool is. Cool comes off of you. It like, it comes out of you without you realizing it. And you end up doing behaviors that you didn't or dress a certain way, or you do certain things that you didn't even necessarily intend upon. You know what I mean? It's, it's a, uh, so like, I, but what Larry Moss is talking about, at least in my interpretation is that people are trying to be cool. They're trying to model cool. They're trying to, mm -hmm. they're making the image of cool and it's fake and it's false. And I think he's has every right, like myself, like to not like it because it's bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a fascinating little history lesson. And I guess it's, you know, language is an evolving thing. So, you know, it's yeah. cool can has has taken on like a couple of different meanings. But yeah, it's like I do. I, I prefer the use of cool like as opposed to like, oh, that's so cool or whatever. I prefer the use as something like more to its original intent based on what you're saying. You know, it's just like. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you think it was just, just like, don't worry, they're cool, they're cool, they're cool, you know, like, it's just like, oh, right, it's like a reassurance that you give yeah, to yeah. somebody, <laughs> it's like, they're cool, don't worry about it, they're cool. Um, yeah, yeah, it's um, as more of like a, there was a quality to it that was more of an inner thing, and yeah, it's interesting that it became kind of an an outer thing that uh, that got sort of lumped in with it. Um well, you know, it makes sense. I don't want to cut you off, but it makes yeah. sense that it became an outer thing because if you think about it, like the cool group was obviously something people wanted to be a part of. So you model what the cool group does because you want to fit in and that's part of the, the thing. And I think artists struggle with this a lot, you know, particularly actors, I think, because eh, probably all artists, but, you know, you want to look like these movie stars. You want to like behave like them and do as they do and all that kind of stuff, right? And so mm -hmm. you can get caught up in like, wanting to be a part of the group and so you model the group whereas like what i think a lot of young actors don't realize is that people will accept you for your uniqueness if you own it and you're not trying to be something other than what you are which is kind of like in 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 a, in a certain sense i think the more modern version of cool um at least on an inner significance level is authenticity you know, when you're really authentic, people are like, oh, that's cool. Like, like that person's really themselves. They're mm -hmm. not like an image that they saw on YouTube or Twitter or, you know, whatever social media thing, you know, they're, they're actually like, that's them. Like how cool. Yeah. 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 And it's, and it's, 
it's fascinating because this works and operates in so many different ways and you see there's there's figures out there in our world and you know i don't know particularly just because fashion is jumping into my mind but people will go just like oh just like look at what they're doing like they're look, look at at what this person is wearing and and sure some of these people have you know stylists and stuff like that but there's still a sense in which when when some people are genuinely uh you know involved in just kind of like wearing something that they really just actually like and maybe mm -hmm. it's a bit different and then people go like oh my god look at what they're doing they're just like on the cutting edge of fashion it's like well maybe to some extent but to a large degree these are people who are just they're they're just doing their thing you yeah. know they're they like they don't give a shit you know necessarily about what people think about what they're doing and and it's in it's like that whole thing of, of like you wearing the clothes as opposed to clothes wearing you. Yeah. Right. Like <laughs> that seems to be play into this conversation a little bit, right? Like you wear the clothes, the clothes don't wear you and, and finding where that sort of, that sort of attitude lives within us. Yeah. Right. Because, and I think that this is an immense problem, you know, in, in our culture and not just with, with art and, I, I sympathize and I empathize and I know I fall, you know, prey to it as well, but we are so always looking for other people to kind of have the answers for us in so many ways, not just in like actual questions that we might have, but in all of these very small, subtle ways. Well, what kind of clothes should I be wearing? Right? <laughs> like yeah. I'm going to look to somebody else. Somebody else needs to tell me what clothes to wear. Let, let's look at this. Let's look at that. And, you know, we can do that we can look out there and and start to get a sense you know of what clothes do what, what like what do you like you know and, and start but that's the important thing you know it's just like because maybe what you like isn't necessarily what is the most popular thing out there in the world right and we have to have the strength and the courage and the and the you know that that center within ourselves that that We'll still go like, well, I don't really give a shit about that. I don't really give a shit if that's that's not the popular look, if that's not the popular trend. This is what I like, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna do it. And there's something, there's something that's so important to that. And I think that this sort of problem of of always looking outside of ourselves to answer questions that can only be answered. <laughs> by us you know like is 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 problematic at best it's problematic in the way we do it because i do think it's important to look outside of yourself because you know we we do use each other and in, in a good way uh, as reference points um because you know style mm -hmm. and fashion is real um you know it's real in the sense that it's real in the sense that we have a, a kind of tradition and a kind of um, consistency and and um, a certain amount of normalcy that we, you know, and, and I think the artist needs to know that. Like, I, I think if you get too far out there and you don't have a grasp on basic rapport and basic like normalcy and things like that, you just become weird. And there's, there is a line, there's kind of a fine line between like being cool or authentic and just being weird. And the weird person in my experience, they just tend to not have enough of a grasp or sometimes enough of a care about what's going on around them. Like they're in their own little world and that's all that matters. And they actually kind of disconnect so much from everyone else that they, they actually um, there, there's no connection anymore. And so like one thing, like when I, when I teach screenwriting, I tend to go under the model. Cause this is, this is something I learned. Basically what I figured out when I, when I started screenwriting was that when I first started screenwriting myself, what I figured out was that I would learn from all these books and I would learn, okay, well, this is how you write a script. And I read so many of them and I started to put together all the pieces and I go, okay, well, basically everybody says, these are all the same things. Everyone says this writer says this a little different. This one says this a little different. 
This one focuses more on that. This one focuses more on this, whatever. But basically, this is the structure of a story. I watched thousands of movies, like and I'm not kidding, like so many movies, and I would break them down and I would understand structure and I'd work it out. And so <clears throat> I started writing screenplays and then I, you know, and then I started like realizing that, well, look, if I break a rule, it has a consequence. So it's like a cause and effect. And what I realized if 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 it goes off the rails, like I'm say I'm following the paint by numbers model, but then I go off number and I start trying something else, that has an effect somewhere else. It changes the picture, it changes it. Now mm -hmm. that's fine. But that means you also have to change another paint by number somewhere else over here because it's going to have an impact because um, just a weird analogy, like your paint by numbers is drawing a duck, right? But now you, you drew out of the line over here. Well, if you draw over the line over here, you're going to also have to draw out of the line over here because otherwise their beak is going to look weird. You know what I mean? But maybe you want their beak to look weird. Maybe that's your intention. But if you don't know that's what you're doing, then you're not really the mindful artist. You're the ignorant artist that's just making mistakes and maybe you're getting lucky. So roundabout way of saying this is basically when I, when I started teaching people how to write screenplays, um, you know, I would teach people, people would just ask me, like, these are just one-on-ones and they can you show me how to write a screenplay? Be sure, fine. And what I'd find is I'd teach them and then they would break a rule. They'd break a guideline. And they would get stuck. And I'd be like, well, what happened? Well, they went this time. Oh, you didn't do what I said. And they said, no, I tried doing this. I'm like, okay, well, there's a cause and there's an effect. So you see the effect. And now you have to go back. Either you have to go back because this didn't work, or you have to work with this thing that you did. And you have to, you have to, you know, you have to know what rule you broke. Mm -hmm. And so when I basically started doing organized classes, um, I know it sounds like a long story, but like here's the bottom line. I teach people the foundational rules of storytelling so that they know what rules to break and what they're breaking and why that matters. But I encourage them to break all those rules. I encourage them to explore and try, but just to understand why that guideline or rule is there in the first place. It's, it's not, it's not there to get you like, it's not, these things are not follow them exactly. It's, know what they are. So when you break them, you know, what's happening, you know, what, what cause and effect is occurring in your story. And then you understand how to work with that, because if you don't know what you're doing, you're just going to end up with a bad script and you won't know why. Yeah. Or you hit writer's block or you hit writer's block, which is actually, <laughs> yeah, you don't even yeah. complete because basically these rules are designed to keep you on track and keep you going a lot of the time, not just to make your story make sense, but actually just to keep the story actually moving. Yeah. Like where does it go from here to here to here to here? And, and, and that's really so that I, it's funny cause I I've experienced that on, on a certain level. Like I, you know, I wrote some stuff with you and then I wrote my own thing and I followed a very sort of, yeah, like I followed a process um, a screenwriting process and I broke it all down. So I knew, you know, what every scene was going to be and how the story all, all flowed. And, and then I tried writing this one script just as like, Oh, I have this idea for the story. Uh, just kind of a loose sketch of, of it in my head. And, uh, I'm just going to start writing it. <laughs> and I started writing it and then it got like, I don't know, I got like 18 pages in or something like that. And I just went, Oh, what the fuck happens now? <laughs> like, <laughs> I know, I know what happens like 20 pages from now, yeah. <laughs> but in between there, what happens? I have no idea. So yeah, like there's absolutely, there's, there's a lot to, you know, those, those things help, help you to just give yourself a direction or at least sometimes I think, they're they're most useful in terms of helping you get your ideas and what's important to you all figured out and organized right like again it's all about like you use these tools right not the tools using you because that's the thing like with color by numbers yeah you're you've got your duck at the end of it but like <laughs> i love that it's a duck <laughs> <laughs> but is anyone interested in the duck yeah. Is there anything interesting about this duck that I haven't seen before? Or is it all just kind of garden variety? Is it all just a little bit 
too vanilla. And that's yeah. the problem when you just try and color by numbers your way through everything. Yeah, you've got something that lo- it looks like something for sure. But why do I give a shit? Yeah. Why do I give a shit about the the duck? And that's the thing that color by numbers <laughs> won't won't do for you. So, you know, well, there's can I say one thing just really yeah, quick. Yeah. That's one thing that's amazing about art. Art can make you give a shit about things that you wouldn't normally give a shit about, like a duck. When art's done well, mm-hmm. you'll care about things that you never would have cared about because there's a way you could do a duck which makes it extremely interesting and unique and involving. Whereas there's a way to do a duck which is just boring and yawn, right? Blah, right? Yeah. Anyway, go on. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. Theoretically, there's a duck that makes you yawn and theoretically there's a duck that will bring you to your knees. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. It's all context and how you're working with it. Yeah. I would be surprised if at some point in human history, someone saw a painting of a duck and they just (laughs) fell to their knees crying. (laughs) (laughs) Would not be surprised at all. Hey everybody, this is Evan. And this episode is brought to you by my book. Yes. I recently released a book called the actor's awakening, connecting spirituality to craft. Expand yourself as an actor and your craft through a spiritual perspective. Take a journey that will explore universal philosophies and insights to help you understand human nature in a profound way and develop practices to take your work to another level. Again, that's The Actor's Awakening, Connecting Spirituality to Craft, available on Kindle and paperback on Amazon. And as always, if you like the show, please subscribe. Um, Let me tell you a story, okay? Just I'll throw it in, right? Okay. A picture of a cat, yawn, right? It was a cat, whatever. But uh, I was in Mexico, Ensenada, and it was the first night I was there. And these wild dogs were like surrounding like this one area. And we were walking down the street and all of a sudden all the dogs just dispersed and ran away. And there was a little kitten laying on the ground and it was wounded from these dogs. And it was like going to die. And it was laying there on the ground. And I was just like, I can't save this thing. The image of that cat, the image of that story could bring you to your knees. And it's a picture of a cat. It's, it's, it, you know what I mean? It just, it's context, it's relationship. It's, it's the story around the story. It's the depth, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it, it's, it's, we, we are very powerful with our internal worlds if we use them. But if your art doesn't use them, it's just a picture of a cat. It's just a picture of a duck. It just doesn't matter, right? We need the, we need the context. We need the, I don't know what it is, but it's the, the you know, there's like a, like a, a word for it, but it's like the something, it's the essence. There's something in it, yeah. Well, to go back to our quote, the inner, the inward significance, right? right? Like the aim of art is to represent not the outward appearance of things, but their inward significance. And, you know, there's a few words in that that I still feel kind of like are important, right? Like the word represent has been kind of sticking out to me. It's like, it's like, because art is a representation, right? It is a representation of something, uh, a translation of something, a communication of something. Um, And... And as the quote goes, it's like it, the, it's not the outward appearance. It's not the duck. It's not the cat just on its own, but like, what, why does that matter? Mm-hmm. You know, why does that matter? What does it speak to in each and every single one of us that makes us care, that connects us to ourselves, that connects us to life in, in a deeper and more meaningful way, you know, just to start things off with, like, I'm, Uh, I mean, there's, there's so many, I, the whole question of what is art, you know, like is still a question that, you know, philosophers and scholars still are talking about today, you know, like, it's like, what is art? Like it's, it's, it's so many different things. Right. Um, and even, you know, beyond what Aristotle has said in this and like what the aim of, of art is, you know, it's like, yeah, that's, that's one big thing, but there's also a whole lot of other aims of art too. There's just something about it that about art that allows us to express, allows us to communicate in a way that is so important, you Mm -hmm. know, and, and, and 
it, it gives it gives meaning it gives it gives us um you know it can be life affirming it can be it can give us strength it can show us a perspective it can change your minds about something like there's there's so much that goes into it but the only way in which it does that is it has to be about something it has to be about something and that and that's something that that comes from each artist as an individual you know and when the artist is most free to to do that when they feel the most free to to be able to express um which is you know side note why freedom of um freedom of speech is so so important you know like freedom of speech and and freedom of the artist is you know like those things are go hand in hand mm -hmm. um because art is a form of speech you know it's a representational form of of speech and and we need to have that kind of freedom and uh because it's 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 the only way in which we can actually understand something that we might call true mm -hmm. yeah there's uh there is a quote i and i don't remember what it's called but it's like um i think it was maybe even david mamet said it i forget though but it's something like we use art to tell like we use the, the lie of art to tell the truth basically some something i've totally mm. butchered it, but it's like that <laughs> idea right probably even got it wrong who said it i don't it doesn't really matter but here's the point like look it's like the, the the art is is incredible because when it's done well you can lie and tell a truth that's why art is amazing because through something entirely imaginary and made up a truth is revealed and shared and profoundly interacted with um you know like you can simply say the sky is blue but to to see the sky you know um to 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 watch the sunset if you had never seen a sunset before it's it's something we take for granted you know like uh um there's so many things like but art can give you an experience of something it can make you understand feelings that you've never had the life experience to have um you know it can it like uh, just thinking about storytelling like you know certain genres can make you laugh about something that you've never had the opportunity to laugh about they can they can scare you in a way you've never been scared before they can show you action and things and excite you in a way that you've never been excited before uh, and it's not just through movies i mean it's through everything right there's all sorts of different things like music uh, i found i've had profound experiences by hearing certain music and it just the right time and the right place, the right song. And all of a sudden it just cracks something open in you, you know? Mm. And it's just like with art, the thing is, is that you don't always know what you're going to do, like what your art is going to do for other people, but you can work on what it does for you. And I think what's really important is that it comes through you. Like, like, you're not just a technician doing your art. You're actually experiencing your art. You're finding the inner significance in your art. You're finding the emotional connections and the ties. And, you know, um, and I think when you're starting out as an artist, I don't, I think you've got to give yourself a little bit of a break. Like, like, look, like all this stuff's new for you. You're learning and you're figuring it out and you're learning, you know, like you might be in an acting class. You're just trying to figure out how to remember your friggin' lines. Like, cause that's the hard part. Right. But like you'll get, that's fine. You'll get to a point where you start to understand how breaking down a scene works. You'll start to learn how to memorize your lines. You'll get the basics down. And when you kind of get that, then you can start doing some pretty cool things with it. And I think the thing is, is that just never fall victim to the idea that um, your art is what it looks like because it's, it's, it's more about how you experience it. And I know this as a writer because my writing changed dramatically when I wrote this one script, Love Lost, because when I wrote that, I just went into it and I like lived in the story during the time I did it. Like, and I don't know how to explain it other than it's like, 
you just you don't worry anymore about if the writing's good. You don't worry if it's going to work anymore. Like I was so beyond all of that. Like I'd written so many scripts and figured out so many things. I just knew all that stuff was taken care of. And then I was just like, I'm just going to experience two characters really having a real conversation about some shit that really matters to them. And let's just see what happens. And man, I laughed and I cried and it was like a memory in my life. It's as real as any memory I've actually lived. And, um, you know, uh, the thing is, is like, I didn't know what response that would have with people. And the response has been incredibly good, but like, I didn't know that it would, res- people would respond that way, but also that didn't matter to me. That wasn't what I was trying to do, but I can tell you one thing for sure. I walked away from that script being a different person. I was different. I, it, it took two days to write the screenplay, the actual screenplay. The day I started writing to the day I wrote the last word, I changed as a human being. Like I literally shifted and transformed over those two days. And the only way that happened was the inner significance was the everything that was, it was all inner significance. And, you know, I think like, uh, you know, whatever, like it's one script, but like, the thing is, is like, that's where art I, I found you know, that's where it is. That's where it exists, you know? And it's like, okay, well, you got a little bit of a taste of that. You figured out kind of how to do that as an artist. So like, what are you going to do with it now? Right? Like, you know, um, and I think uh, the thing is, is that we can try so hard to write a good script or write a, or paint a great painting or make a great song. And we forget, like, look, you got to like be in the song. You got to like be in the painting. There has to be you in there. And then, you know, it'll look how it'll look and it'll sound how it'll sound, right? It's, uh, that's kind of the, the point that I'm trying to make here, really, is there's just something, there's something beyond the end result. There's something deeper and, and, and a little less tangible, a little less obvious. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's always, for me, there's this, quality at least that i that i look for in in art you know great art for me it always does this one thing for me and and no matter what the medium is but it's something that well for one that like it's i said like it connects to something real there's there's some sort of a unspeakable truth um Mm. that that gets that gets hit, but there's this quality of, I, for me, I find that, that great art, it reminds me of the beauty and sacredness of life. You know, like there's, there's of, of every single moment, you know, like it's, it's funny because we can, look at like a painting of of a sky i think you had mentioned like a sky before earlier yeah. on and it's just like we can look at a painting like a beautiful like you know van gogh painting of like the sky <laughs> or or something like that and just be like wow that is just so so incredible and and be moved by it and then be staring up at a beautiful night sky in person and, you know, be more concerned with the text message that just came through on our phone. (laughs) You know, like it's, it's a funny thing. Like, uh, you know, there's some more quotes that, that, uh, that I've seen that would be fun to, to kind of explore because there's a lot of great artists who have talked about how art is always in some ways trying to just catch up with what's already there in nature. You know, like we're just, it, and how it's in many ways a poor imitation of it. But in so, in so many ways, art can, can remind us to look at these things, right? To be like, look at how beautiful the fucking sky is. When's the last time you looked at the sky? You know, and, and for some reason there's, there's something about art that will make us look more closely, more deeply which is a fascinating thing, you know, like we take, sometimes we take what's out there actually in the world and in nature and we take it for granted. 
Um, but then somebody paints it and suddenly we go, oh, wow, <laughs> how incredible. And she's like, I'm just taking that from what's there. I'm just taking this from what's there. And I've painted this because of how extraordinary it is, how extraordinary, how taken I was in this moment by how that sky looked on this day. Like, it's just for the artist, they were connected to something, you know, and maybe they don't even entirely know what that was Mm -hmm. that they were connected to, but it had to come through somehow. And now it's being shared. And, and it's, it's always pointing to our lives in some way. It's always pointing to who we are, uh, in some bigger way that is at least great art, you know, um, which I think is a part of this whole, this whole thing about inner significance as well. There's something that I, we haven't really talked about and I wanted to bring in was, um, the intention of art, like, what's it trying to do? Like, what are you trying to do with it? Why, why are you Mm. even doing it? And, um, I think there is a a certain amount of, I just do it because I like it, you know, it's fun and I wanted to do it and you know, whatever. But I think there's also another part of art. And I think where art really kind of, I don't know, makes an impact is like, like you have something to say, you're, you're you're like, like, there's an intention behind it. Like, and I, I find with, with stories, like I remember when I first learned about theme in stories, people were like, this theme is love. This theme is like, and it was like so basic. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, everything's about love though. Come on. Like everything, like love and power. Like if this is, like, that's not a theme. That's a, that's so basic. Yeah. And what I started to realize is like, Um, and I realized this in my like late twenties, mid to late twenties, I started to realize that theme was, it was like a science experiment. It's like a belief that you're willing to test through a story. And and if you do it for real, you come to a, you come to a, a, almost an awareness you didn't have when you started the story. So for example, uh, you know, men and women can't be friends. Sex will always get in the way. It might, you might say is the theme of when Harry met Sally and probably some other movies, but like, by the end of that movie, you have a better understanding of, is that true or not true? And I think like good art, it kind of takes these ideas that we're not quite sure about. And it gives us an experience of them because maybe you don't believe men and women can be friends. Maybe you think that they sex will always get in the way that there always be this component that kind of stops that from really being true. Well, but maybe a story can give you an experience of how it's possible in a way that you've never seen it before in a way that you've never thought about it before. And so it is true, but it's only true once you have the awareness of looking at it a different way. You know what I mean? Um, and you know, maybe the story helps you remove some hangups that you have about what stops you from being able to have those types of friendships. Um, you know, and, and every story, you know, a lot of these great stories, like one of my favorite movies, I'm just going to throw this in as well. Like fight club was a very important movie for me when I saw it, which I think I was 16 and, um, yeah, something like that, 15, 16 years old. I don't know, somewhere around there. And anyway, uh, it really showed me that like this idea of needing to be special was actually not helping me, it was hurting me. And also my parents were going through a big divorce and we were losing everything. And my my family at that point, like were like millionaires. And And I went from living in a mansion to living in a, a trailer park. And another thing that that movie pointed out was like, you're not your fucking khakis. Like you're not your, your mansion. You're not this money. You're not this Porsche. You're not any of this shit. Like, you know, but you're not also not special. And, and, and that gave me this really cool kind of um, step into adulthood, which was that I don't need anything in the world to matter. But at the same time, I don't need to matter. And I wrestled with that a lot. <laughs> don't get it really wasn't solved. 
but it gave me an incredible touch point experience that I referred to many, many times over my life. And it got me to this point. And, you know, like for the first time in my life, I feel like Fight Club is not my favorite movie anymore, only because it served its purpose for a period in my life. And now I'm kind of more interested in some other movies, but I think it was my favorite movie for a long time because it was one of those movies that helped me in a profound way um, separate from everything because like, like I was living through the experience of losing everything and like status and money and things and, and everything. And that movie just happened to come along and it just gave me a realization that like, you know, um, also the whole thing about, I'm not even going to finish that thought. The whole thing about being a space monkey in this movie, right? If you guys haven't seen this movie, like that whole idea of like, just giving up everything of who you are to belong. Like it made me see that it's like, no, you like, like you don't, you're not a space monkey. You're not a, you're not, you're not just a part of this societal cult of thinking. Like you can be a unique individual. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to be special and you don't have to wear nice khakis essentially, or whatever, you know, the metaphor, but you don't have to, you don't have to have anything and you don't have to be special, but you also don't need to be like everybody else. You know what I mean? And it kind of gave me this, this unique experience of that because it was done so well. So, I mean, and the book was also great. The novel was great as well, which I read as well. But like, the thing is, is like, that's what art does. It can give you an experience and it can give you like a life changing thing. Um, and you might not know what your art is doing for other people. And I don't think you should concern yourself too much with that. But I think if you're really trying to tell a story truthfully, if you're really trying to be authentic, if you're really trying to like, you know, you think there's something meaningful and you want to try and get to it and get it out. Right. Um, if you do that for real, I mean, I think that a lot of your art will transcend you, you know? And I mean, like I'm talking about this movie, like, you know, decades later, really, like, it's like crazy. I mean, that, that's how big of an impact it had on me. Right. Um, so, you know, it's, is it a good looking film? Did they shoot it? Well, did they act it? Well, yeah, they did all that stuff really well, but it's, you know, like we're talking, it's the inner significance of the story that really matters. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I remember, you know, like the first screenwriting book that I read, you know, one of the, the things that the, uh, the author of it, Jeff Kitchen put in was like, he has this who cares test. Yeah. You know, like it, that it's his thing for anyone who, whenever he's kind of called in to, to help get a script, like into, into better shape and whatever, or, you know, he's hearing a bunch of pitches from, from people. It's like, he'll hear their stories and it's like, okay, but who cares? Right. Like, tell me why, like, tell me the, the, the human meaning, tell me the inner significance of this story and why the story needs to be told. Right. So it's, it's like kind of a nice, simple, it's, it's a little bit, you know, it might sound a little bit harsh, but like, you know, there's a kind of, there's a kind of wisdom to it as well, which is like, does it pass the who cares test? Right. Like who cares That's about a lot of people? What's that? Sorry. That test has helped a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. Like it just, just go in a little bit deeper. What is the story all about? Very often you have the element there. It just needs to be brought out. Yeah. You know, it just needs to be, um, it just needs to be made more important in the story, you know, cause it gets, it, it'll get, it gets lost in all of the kind of razzle dazzle and all of that stuff. And, hey, yeah. We, we love all of the razzle dazzle. We, we love the spectacle and things like that. It's all great stuff, but you know, it's, it's got to come from something. Otherwise it's just, it, who cares? Yeah. Right. Who cares? I don't, I don't care. I've, I've slept through movies that have, you know, all the budget and all of like the explosions and <laughs> effects and, and it looks beautiful and all of this stuff. And then it's just like, and I'm, and I'm asleep, you know, I'm, I've, I'm asleep on the couch because it's just like, I don't care. I don't really care about these characters. I don't really care about what they're doing. I don't really care. You know, like it's, it's, and it's really a shame, you know, because, uh, very often it's, it's like these things are, are correctable, 
you know, like it, you, you can, you can, but it's always best to, to get to those things right out of the gate, you know, as being like, that's the thing you, you start from there as much as possible. You start from that place of inner significance mm-hmm. um, and, and let everything, cause then you'll, you'll find less of those issues. It's like, and, and, and you will continue to find ways in which to, to better express it and communicate it as you go. But it's, it's a guy, it's a kind of guiding light within art, um, that you, I think that you've got to have with you. It's your, it's the first thing that you want to have with you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you really do. You got to have like an intention. You got, you got to be wanting to do something. And I, I mean, I, I don't think you need to get too complex about it either. I think a lot of the time, um, you know, it, it can really just be a simple thing that you're trying to do. I, 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 we've talked about a lot of stuff here in this conversation. And I think sometimes these types of talks can, can make people go away and maybe get a little too heady about it all. But like, look, like I always try to remind people when they're writing a screenplay, like, look, if you're writing a comedy, your job is to make people laugh. And if that's your intention, You can have a ridiculous story, like ridiculous, crazy nonsense is happening. But if it's making people laugh, that might work. You know what I mean? The intention here with a comedy is to make people laugh. That's why they're watching your movie and that's the service you're providing. So, you know, like um, as an artist, like sometimes you just go, okay, like I want to write a comedy or I have some funny things, like make it funny. That's what you have to do. That's your number one most important goal before you... Like if you're doing a comedy and you're trying to think like, what's the theme and the deep meaning of the story? Like who gives a shit? Are you making people laugh or not? Because first of all, that's all that matters. Now, if you can make people laugh, then you might be able to sneak a deeper meaning, a deeper theme in there. But like, if you can't even make them laugh, you're not even doing a comedy and we have a problem. You know, if it's a drama, then you got to make them feel, you got to make them emotional. If it's a horror movie, you got to make them scared. You got to make them frightened. You got to make them freaked out, startled, all that stuff. If you're not doing that, it doesn't really matter about any of this stuff. So the way I try to look at things, you know, and this is what I would tell my younger self who was just getting into this. I would say, look, like, first of all, do your job. Like, what's your job? Like, if you're writing a screenplay, your, your job is to finish the script. That's your first job. Like, look, I don't even care if you write a shit script. Like, just finish a script because until you write a script, you're not a screenwriter. You know, your, your, your talk and your bullshit. So write a script. That's the first thing you're supposed to do. The second thing now is if you could do this at the same time, this would be great. And if you have a little mentorship coaching direction, then, you know, it's a little easier, but it's like, what genre are you writing? Okay. Drama action. There's only five that you can really choose. There's a few like sub genres, but it's like action, horror, comedy, drama, or thriller. And each one of those has an emotional expectation. Deliver on that emotional expectation. Maybe that's your second script. Now you've written two scripts and you've actually done this. I mean, you know, if you worked with me, you would just do it in one, but whatever, that might be how you have to do it. But do that. And if you can do that, then you're actually doing your job. Then we can start getting deeper. We can start going, okay, what is your script actually saying? What's the intention? You know, like... um, (laughs) So like, if you're painting a picture, you're writing a song, you're doing anything, like do your job first. That's your first thing you got to do, do the task. And like, don't make excuses for, um, I need to have, you know, I was listening to the way of the artist podcast, <laughs> I need to have this deep, profound, like inner significance. It's like, look, like, first of all, you don't even know how to write a script. So <laughs> That's what you got to figure out first. Okay. I'm going to tell you something. There's a little secret. You'll find out that your inner significance helps you write the script, but by writing the script, you'll figure that out. So like, you know, it, it's, um, it, it, there's, a, there is kind of a wonderful thing. I'm like, look, reach out for help if you need help. But like, th- this is a basic thing. I just, I think it's most important is like, look, we're talking about kind of higher level art today. This is really what this conversation is about. We're talking about the artist that's already doing it, that wants to take themselves from a vanilla artist into their true essence and authenticity. And and what does that mean? Inner significance needs to be in your art. 
But if you're starting out and you're an artist and you just tuned into this conversation, or maybe you're an artist and you're not getting anything done, do your job. <laughs> Memorize your lines. <laughs> you know, if you're an actor, like learn how to play the chords on your guitar. If you're trying to play the guitar, like you got to do the basics, you know, you don't, mm -hmm. you don't get to jump those steps. Um, and, and, and when I wrote this script, Love Lost, right, I just want to share this because I think it relates to all of this. By the time I wrote that script, I think I had written like 30 already, like 20 something, 30 scripts. And I had helped other people write screenplays and done all this stuff. I knew how to write a screenplay. I was teaching people how to write screenplays. I knew that I knew story structure. I knew how to build a character. I knew how to do dialogue action. I knew how to do all that stuff. That was easy. That was nothing for me. How to put my heart and spill my guts into that, that was, you know, and I'm hoping, you know, that we do this podcast and you'll learn that faster than I did because it took me a long time to learn that. It took me a long time to get to that point. And in my opinion, but I think people could learn it quicker if they have good guidance and good direction and whatever. But at the end of the day, if you don't write a script, none of it fucking matters if you're a screenwriter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, <laughs> it, it is interesting because there's, there's always different approaches to everything because I mean, there can be a value to just like, well, I've got this thing that's really inside me that I want to give it some voice and express it. And maybe you don't have any real technical know-how and you know, it's like, I always in, encourage it, but at the same time, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes you got to just like learn the nuts and bolts Right. And then once you've got some of the nuts and bolts down, then we can say like, okay, now what do you want to say? What do you actually want to say? Right. And now that you've got some things. So, I mean, there's, there's plenty of ways to, uh, to skin a cat as they say. Uh, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's do the beer thing, Brandon. The beer thing, Evan. Let's do the beer thing. The beer thing? All right. Um, I'll go first. I'm drinking the Lumberjack. I don't even know how to say this, but the Lumberjack Kaveik Ale. It's spelled K-V-E-I-K. Lumberjack Kaveik Ale. Mm. And uh, I don't know. I guess it's like a, it's kind of like, it's it's like an inspired by like the Nordic countries kind of a beer. Um but it's good. Like, I don't quite know how to describe what this beer is. It is like, it's not super hoppy. It's kind of like just a nice, easy drinking ale. Um, but it's actually 6%. Okay. So it's pretty strong. Uh, but you wouldn't necessarily know that. And, uh, I'm, I'm actually definitely, I'm, I'm feeling this one a, a little bit, but it's really good. So, and that was from Whistler Brewing company if i didn't already mention that but nice yeah well evan i also have a six percent alcohol level beer oh goodness there you go this one's from cabin brewing company in calgary alberta and it's called super saturation and it looks uh i don't know if like, people can see it whatever it doesn't matter <laughs> um <laughs> it kind of looks super retro it's pretty good beer um it's a, a New England pale ale. Um, yeah, it's good. I mean, it's tasty. It's, uh, hold on a sec. Let me give it a sip and just tell you what I think. <laughs> just refresh your lips. It actually, you know what? Honestly, I feel like I'm underselling it. It's actually pretty tasty. Um, tasty. It's got a really good flavor to it. Um, it's been a good beer. I mean, I've been having it. I've been enjoying it. You know, I don't think about it too much. I actually went out. And I had some beers with, um, well, they didn't, I was with somebody, they didn't have any beers and I had a couple of flights and they were like, do the craft beers actually taste different? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. There's like a big difference, you know? Like, and it was funny because they don't drink beer and they don't, they just decidedly don't like beer. And I was like, yeah, no, like every beer, you know, they, like, they all have a little bit of difference and it's, uh, you know, some are better than others. Some, you know, people, some people prefer more than others, but they're all unique and they all have kind of have this really uh, cool quality to them. But I also love like the whole craft beer world and it's fun. Yeah. 
Okay, well, let's wrap it up, I guess. Um, yeah. I'll go first. All right? Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> but please, take it away. Okay. I, I accomplished something the other day, which is kind of nice. Um, I've now written for 3,500 days in a row for at least 30 minutes every single day. And that means that in 150 days from now, I will have written for 10 years in a row never missing a day, always writing for half an hour every day. And it's interesting, you know, kind of coming to this milestone because this was at one point a very, very far away idea and an impossible seeming idea as well, because there's been days where it's been so hard to follow through and, and just do it. I just didn't want to. And there's many days I wanted to give up, but I just decided to keep going. And what I've kind of like learned through all of this is that, you know, your relationship to your art changes and your art is often the culprit. <laughs> the art in itself is the master teacher. If you, if you do it and you just commit to it and you, you work with, it, you know, um, and I mean, like when it started, I was just like, I just want to be a really good screenwriter. And then I started writing screenplays and writing a lot of scripts, doing this type of stuff. And then it started to become like, I want to be, uh, you know, I want to, I want to figure out how to write novels and I want to figure out how to do copywriting. And I've learned all these different like writing, like variations and ways over 10 years. And I've learned how to communicate. I've learned how to better articulate my ideas, all sorts of stuff. I think, you know, what I'm kind of gathering through this conversation is that, you know, there is a technique to art. You, you do have to learn how to do some of this stuff. Like there, there are foundational and fundamental skills that like, if you don't have them, you're not really going to get the inner significance out. You know, like you need to know the chords on the guitar, to be able to play guitar, to be able to get the music to come out. Like, and if you can't, play the chords properly, you're not going to be able to communicate those notes that you're trying to do. Right. And writing's the same way, you know, like until you figure out how to kind of express your ideas and how to like, you know, put them through certain mediums, um, you're just not going to be able to express like what's in your imagination and internal world around that. So, um, I, I think what I, what I would walk away from this is going like, look, if you're in a stage where you're like, I don't know the foundations well enough, go back to the basics. That would be my first advice for you. Just go back to the basics and like figure those things out and don't overcomplicate it. Like your job, if you're trying to play guitar or something is like, learn the chords. If it's writing, like learn and understand the writing. Like if it's acting, you know, get your line memory down. Like you know, get, get a few of the basics down, right? But don't look at that as the answer. Look at that as the beginning stages of taking the training wheels off. Because, and, and if, you're an, if you're someone, if you're an artist where you feel like, okay, I've done the work, I learned how to do my craft. This conversation is about take those training wheels off and start trusting that you have them and that you can balance with them and start putting your inner world into your work. And as scary and frightening and as vulnerable as that is, that's what's going to take you into a new stratosphere as an artist. And there is the technician, and the technician is an important kind of stage of your artistry, but don't stop at the technician and don't think the final goal is being a technician of art. The goal is inner significance, and you need the technical skills to do it, but they're just only to get you to the point. And like, if you've just gotten to the point where you feel like you finally got your technical ability down, that's when your journey begins, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, I think that um, Mr. Aristotle kicked off a, a really great conversation for us today. And I'm excited to uh, do some more of these you know, and, and just, just riff off of some terrific things that, uh, that people today and throughout history have, have said about art and an artful life. And, and this was a, a great place to, to start things off with. I think it was a nice and 
big some big ideas in in this one um in this sort of this this difference between the representation uh, of the outer and the significance of the inner and really the aim of art because you know what like yes there's every art form has an outer expression like it that's that goes along with it you know otherwise nothing art doesn't even exist right like it it is it has an outer expression right that that's Im, that's implicit and explicit with art it comes in the form of something it comes in a form it comes as a painting it comes as a music it comes as a performance it comes as something um but it's what makes the art necessary ultimately and we become craftspeople and we learn about what we do so that that inner thing can be has the possibility of being more and more fully expressed in its entirety in its fullness in that thing but that 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 outer form cannot replace the inner thing and i think that that is the really the crux of this this conversation at least for me which is that there's no technique that can that can replace that inner substance that you're bringing that you're you're bringing through that you're trying to bring through and we need to start you know as soon as you're able to i think you know as soon as you're able to start to start putting that into your work the better i mean i would argue start doing it immediately you know in in some way try to start bringing it through immediately even while you're still you know getting to grips with the 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 nuts and bolts and the and the structure of of what it is you're trying to do you can always still and try to to put in that that who cares element because i think that that will show you a lot of things as well that will teach you a lot of things about what you're trying to do technically as well you know like you will you will see how the things the technical things that you're trying to learn can can partner with the message that you have with the thing that's inside you can see how um how they they can inform one another right it's not simply about like, oh, well, you have to learn this so that this can come through. Well, the thing coming through can also help you to learn this too, right? Like can, it can show you what you need to do, where you need to go, where you have potentially some weaknesses, right? It's just like, oh, I need to develop this because I'm, this is what I'm trying to say in this and that's not, that's not coming out. So here's some things that I can look at. Here's some things I can work on, but the what necessitates the art is really that that sort of inner significance what necessitates it what is fueling the need for it to come into existence do not overlook this in in favor of just thinking that it's all about just how you make it look and and making sure that you're checking all of the right right boxes who cares? What do you have to say is always the question that we need to be asking. Thank you for listening in on our conversation today. We hope you found something helpful that you can carry forward with you. Head over to our website, wayoftheartist.com, for more free exclusive material and learn about the show. If you haven't already, please support us by subscribing to the show, sharing it with people you know, and keeping compassionate, creative conversation going.